And good evening, everybody. Dr. Bill Tulo, Medical Director at Oculus, and welcome to the Oculus Educational Webinar Series. I am really excited tonight to have our guest speaker, Dr. John Gellies. The title of his presentation is, You Want a Penicam with CSP Pro? Watch this first. As most people know, Dr. Gellies is a Director of Specialty Contact Lens Division of the Cornea and Laser Eye Institute and the CLEI Center for Keratoconus in Teaneck, New Jersey. He's an Assistant Clinical Professor at Rutgers New Jersey Medical School in the Department of Ophthalmology and Vision Science and an Adjunct Clinical Professor at the State University of New York College of Optometry, Illinois College of Optometry, and the New England College of Optometry. Without any further ado, Dr. John Gillies. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. So, <laughs> so today, I'm hoping that we can have a little fun with this one. You know, Bill uh, asked me, you know, hey, would you do a, a webinar on uh, CSP Pro? And, uh, you know, I was sitting there going, well, what should we title this? And, uh, you know, we, we kind of came up with this. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> today we're going to go ahead and run through, uh, you know, obviously a uh, Oculus webinar, but run through all the various use cases of the Pentacam and really focus in on the CSP and how I use it in the office. So we know that the Pentacam is really, you know, the standard of care tomography device for, you know, measuring of, uh, of, of corneas and corneal diseases. It gives us just a variety of different metrics that are applicable to just about anything you could ever want to do with a cornea or want to follow on a cornea. So we're able to get, you know, curvature elevations of the anterior and the posterior surface. We're able to get thickness globally of the cornea. We're also able to use this to find the uh, corneal clarity and corneal densitometry. And then there's a variety of different algorithms on the device that are able to correlate multiple different metrics together to give us you know, uh, comparisons to normative databases and to tell us when something's out of the ordinary or track when something has changed. So it has just tremendous utility, but one of the newer levels of utility is going into the way that we can map uh, the cornea and the sclera together for the purposes of fitting contact lenses. So this is our setup in our office here. You can see our Pentacam Wave AXL on the right here. Uh, and the Wave AXL has a lot of different uh, utilities in it. Three main sensors that we have in it. We have optical biometry in addition to our shine plug tomography and wavefront aberrometry. So when we look at these together, what we're able to get is a full comprehensive report on an individual's ocular system. So not only are we able to map out the cornea, but we're also able to map out the vision of the individual and map out the length of the eye. When we have all those components together, we know the anterior and posterior surface of the cornea, so we can consider that the lens of the cornea. And then we can look at the anterior and posterior, the intraocular lens, and we now know the lens of the uh, crystalline lens in the eye. And then we know the overall length because of our optical biometry. And then we know the clarity uh, and uh, deviation of those aberrations of the entire optical system of the eye. So we know just about everything about that eye uh, refractively. So this can be tremendous. Not only that, we obviously know everything that we can know about the corneal structurally. Now, when we use this system, the system is really uh, using a shine plug uh, camera as its main uh, uh, sensor. So what we're doing is we're taking slices of the cornea and then recreating those into a three-dimensional uh, uh, surface, or rather not surface, but three-dimensional uh, object, and that being the cornea. Uh, when we do this, we can, uh, we do this on the cornea initially, but what they did with the original CSP, which stands for corneal scleral profile, what they did was they used the Scheinfeld camera, and what we did was we got sensor images of not just the cornea, but then we extended it out onto the sclera and uh, you know, obviously overlying uh, conjunctiva. And we were able to capture these images 
and use those slices of the cornea with the corneal scleral areas and be able to come up with a much wider surface scan. Uh, we're able to get about 16 millimeters uh, to 17 millimeters on the original um, uh, uh, CSP. And you can see it here. What we were doing, this was with our Penicam HR. Um, I believe uh, original CSP, and Bill can talk to this a little bit more, uh, is available on a couple of the different models out there. Um, but basically the way that this works is we're going to take five different uh, image sets. So we're going to take one centrally on the cornea, one on the nasal side, the temporal side, the superior and the inferior, so that we can get that corneal and scleral shape. So what we can do is essentially get a three-dimensional uh, mapping of that scleral shape. So almost like a corneal topographer, uh, but all the way out uh, onto the sclera. So now we can understand that scleral geometry. Um, now there are a few different devices out there. The advantages that the Penicam have uh, are actually uh, quite a few. Um, the shine plug imaging, it requires no fluorescein. Um, in fact, actually, if you did use fluorescein on this, uh, because the, uh, the slit is blue that's projected by the uh, Penicam, You'd actually create a whole bunch of flare to the image and uh and you get some errors there so don't put fluorescein uh, on the eye before you image this one um the other thing that was so interesting or, or so important to the success of this is that you can export this data um, now, oculus has always been very very open source with its data and the ability to export this it can be imported into various different contact lens design programs and also uh, online calculators so that you can you know select the best fitting lens or you know pick a first trial lens or design your own lens like what you can do with the wave software um, but you know the original csp did have uh, some some limitations to it right taking five images can take a little bit of time right uh, it would be amazing if we could just take this all in one shot, right? Well, welcome to the CSP Pro. This is essentially where the evolution of this has led. Um, what's happened is in the uh, CSP, or excuse me, in the uh, Pentacam Wave AXL, uh, what they've done is they've extended, uh, or rather changed or modified the sensor to give us a wider scan with much higher resolution. What this is able to do is to allow us to get a single capture. So you can see in the images there, um, if we go back to the other one just for a hot second here, you can see that the center of this scan here, and hopefully you're able to see my cursor, um, but what you can see is on the center of that scan, you have that gray area, right? And that gray area that's surrounded by the purple on the right, the green on the superior, the blue on the left and the red inferiorly and each one of those quadrants or those colors represents a different scan and if it, you look at the profile scans off to the left you can see where that data is the gray goes right down the center the per or excuse me the green off to the left uh, and the red off to the right and then the blue off to the left and the purple off to the right Essentially what that is, is the rotated slices around the eye and the indication of where those uh, components of those scans fit into the, uh, the meshing of the, uh, the surface. So when you get to this scan, this is captured in a single image. You can see that instead of taking multiple images, we were able to get full coverage of this eye uh, without any problems. And you can see this extends all the way out to 18 millimeters, and this was done in one shot. Um, so fantastic. But also, if you're missing a little bit of area, you can go ahead and capture an additional image or two so that you can get additional coverage and complete areas of the map that you may not have, uh, have captured before. Now, the really cool part about this is that it's all seamless. So you can imagine in a busy clinic, one of the things that can break up your flow 
is having to jump in back into the line of patients and say, hey, I need to get another uh, another you know scan here for this patient. Uh, we need to go ahead and kind of make our way in. Well, in this the uh, the software for the Pentacam Wave AXL, uh, it is right in their sequence of scans. So when you get to the Pentacam Wave AXL, you're going to get your traditional corneal tomography. It's also going to do uh, wavefront aberrometry and then optical biometry. And then the last selection that you can choose is to do a CSP scan. So we can get this all while the patient is sitting in front of this device. And the cool part about this is not only is it giving you kind of the bread and butter scans of what you would want really on any patient. So it's able to give you, because of the wavefront aberrometry, just your baseline autorefraction but it's also collecting your baselines for axial length, uh, which is gonna be very important for those doing myopia management, which should be everybody at this point, um, but also being able to capture all the data that you need about the cornea. So getting a good look at this, and then you can really understand the full optical system. But in that same time, you're able to capture these CSP scans. So when we look at this, it flows seamlessly uh, into the way that it's in the office. Now, how does it really work? Well, this is kind of the best way to describe it. You have your rotating shine plug camera, and we're able to rotate this slit around. And while we're capturing that blue slit, the camera is capturing images the entire time. So essentially what you're getting are these cross sections that you see. CSP Pro works by doing two rotations or revolutions. Your first one is a bright illumination, and that's so that you can capture everything about the cornea. The second revolution is done with a lower intensity, and that's so that you get rid of some of that uh, flare off of the, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, off of the scleral uh, tissue. So you end up with uh, really, really good mapping overall. So when we look at this, we can then go ahead and do this in two different displays. So the data will come up in either a image display where we can highlight or rather roll through the slices and I can take a look at each, each individual image that was used to compile uh, those slices of the cornea that you see, or rather the cornea and sclera uh, that you see off to the left. Uh, now, we can also turn this into a map mode, and this map mode then fits a best fit sphere to the scleral shape, as well as an additional best fit sphere to the corneal shape. And with this, we're also able to get more data, such as the slopes or the angles at which the sclera uh, has at, at the, uh, the various different ring diameters and we can change those ring diameters. So let's say I was going to work with a lens that lands at 16 millimeters, right? So let's say it's maybe an 18 millimeter lens, and I know it's going to land somewhere between you know, 15 and 16 millimeters, and I want to know what angle's going on there. I can go ahead and adjust the ring diameter in that upper right, and then I can see what sort of angles we have uh, at those areas so I can best understand, you know, hey, am I going to need a steep or a flat in this quadrant? Am I going to need to flatten this area? Uh, you can really understand what sort of geometries you're working with. The other thing that's right next to those angles is the sagittal heights, right? Now, if you like to work in an elevation, which is what we all know how to work with in a scleral lens, Elevation is really the destination. Curvatures are just how you get there. When we look at this, what we're seeing is that you want to have uh, each one of these angles uh, to be something that you're, you're or, or rather, <laughs> each one of these quadrants being the elevation that you're looking at. So if you have a lower elevation, we know that that is going to have or rather a greater elevation, you know that that area is going to have a steeper angle because it's more depressed, right? So when we look at this, not only can we understand 
the elevations in each quadrant, the angles in each quadrant, but then we can drop down to the, uh, the map down here and we can really understand uh, where the quadrants are and are these symmetric quadrants. Like this eye is almost a perfectly quadrant eye. You can see that we have a top and a bottom, a left and a right, and they're almost equal in arc length. And the top and the bottom and the left and the right are relatively equal. Well, uh, the, the, uh, the nasal and temporal sides are equal uh, in their elevation. But if we look at the inferior to the superior, we can see that there's more depression inferiorly and more elevation superiorly. So this individual would actually do very well in a quadrant specific design. So by looking just at this map, I'm able to understand what design is going to be best for an individual. Now, what we also wanna do is we want to evaluate these scans. We wanna make sure that the data that we're getting here is good data. So we wanna evaluate this for artifacts or broken lines along the way, right? And we wanna look at the coverage map to make sure that we're getting complete coverage of the, uh, the, the cornea and sclera. Um, so in these cases, it's extremely important to get the lids all the way out of the way. But you can see on this image on the left, right, we can see that there are gaps, right? We can see that those sloped uh, slices of the cornea sclera on the left are missing some data there. We don't have full complete lines. And that's because a lid is in the way, right? And you can see on our coverage map, we're missing that. We can see it in our, uh, in our scleral elevation map. And you can even see it in the, uh, the angles and uh, elevation uh, cross sections up at the top. So what can we do? Well, we can add another scan. So simply all we did here was we lifted the upper lid out of the way even further. And you can see that that blue area is the, add, uh, the added or stitched scan. And when we added that, you can see how it filled in all those data gaps and now we have a good understanding of this eye's geometry. Now, what we can look on this is we can look at the patterns, right? Now, what are these patterns gonna tell us? Well, look at the eye on the left. The eye on the left has very, very obviously equal spacing or equal arc lengths of the elevated, uh, the redder areas, and the depressed areas, right? The purple areas. So when we look at this, it's very symmetric. Each area is about 90 degrees apart. And we can see that we have, you know, a top, bottom, a left, and a right here, and it's equally spaced. I know that if I was going to fit this diagnostically, I could be very successful because this has a very quadrant appearance using a quadrant-specific design. It should work very, very well. Now, if we move over to the right-hand image, you can see this eye is a mess right? We can see that there is an area of depression with immediately next to it an area of elevation, and you can see the arc lengths on those are about 60 degrees and 30 degrees respectively, and then the rest of the lens is relatively spherical, or the rest of the scleral shape rather, is relatively spherical. Now, when I look at this, I go, okay, this is not going to be a really easy eye to fit, with a diagnostic lens. This individual would be better served as a freeform design, right? Something where we use a, a data-driven design, such as a you know, wave-designed lens or a scan-fit designed lens, or if you have impression-based materials, you can take an impression of the eye, but this eye is gonna be much better served by using one of those uh, other types of lens fitting approaches rather than a diagnostic fitting. This is gonna be a complicated fit. So when I see something like this, it's helping me decide what direction I'm gonna go. So in our clinic, the way that I love to think about this is if I'm seeing a brand new patient and they've never worn a lens before, I'm gonna go ahead and get a CSP scan and I'm gonna let that determine which direction I'm gonna go. If it's a very simple, straightforward eye, I may decide, hey, let's just diagnostically fit that. 
If it's a very complex geometry, I'm going to go, okay, well, I'm going to do my, uh, my scan-based lens and, or my impression-based lens for that individual. Um, now, let's go to another couple of examples here, right? So you can see on the left here, you can see that our arc lengths are a little different. You can see now that this is not exactly a symmetric quadrant anymore. If we look at the left-hand side of that left map, we can see that there is an arc length of about 120 degrees of depression, followed by a arc length of about 60 degrees uh, in the superior of elevation, followed by this odd blend uh, on the on the uh, nasal side here, uh, going from a, a depressed area to an elevated area. So when we look at that, we're going, okay, well, this is clearly a complex uh, ocular geometry, and this is going to be, excuse me, best fit uh, served with a freeform design. Same thing if we look off to the other side here on the right hand side, you can see that there is a, you know, if we go to the superior area or the superior uh, temporal side here, you can see that we have about a 60 degree quadrant of depression, followed by about another 60 degree quadrant of elevation, followed by about a 60 to 70 degree arc of depression followed by another arc of, uh, of, you know, a little bit of depression, a little bit closer to, uh, to, you know, matching the best fit sphere, and then it runs into a 30 degree arc of elevation. These would be very, very challenging eyes to fit. So based on this, it helps me determine that and me go, I am not going to waste my time diagnostically fitting this eye. So, now, what I also neglected to tell you on this, which is very, very important, is this middle stripe between the maps and the angles. You can see it tells you your white to white, where your corneal center is. And then off to the right here, what we have is the sagittal height of the scleral lens, right? So what it's doing is it's taking this corneal scleral map and it's looking at the average depth of the map at the ring diameter that you've selected. And what it's then doing is it's adding the central clearance value that you select. So let's say I want to have a, or I want to select a first fit trial lens for this individual, right? What I would do is I would set the ring diameter to about the, the, the landing zone of the lens that I want to use. So let's say I'm going to use a 16 millimeter lens, and I know that that's going to land somewhere between 14 and 15 millimeters. So I'm going to set my ring diameter to 15 millimeters. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down and set the corneal clearance that I want over that cornea. <clears throat> Excuse me. So let's say in this case, I want 300 microns. What it's going to do is take that average sagittal height and it's going to add 300 microns to it and it's going to tell me the depth of the lens that I should be using when I go to put that on. So what sort of trial lens I'm going to pick and put onto the eye so that we can get a best fit trial lens. Now we did a uh, a interesting uh, uh, study in our our facility uh, at the end of last year, and this was actually data that we presented at uh, at GSLS uh, in one of our posters. But the idea here was to uh, you know see what sort of you know, direction we could take this data. If we used it to, you know, pop it into a lens calculator and then get a best fit lens uh, based on this uh, one fit design versus, you know, if we go ahead and we import it uh, into a, uh, a data set, right? So what we did here in one of these uh, trials was we looked at selection of trial lenses, right? So 
when we did this, what we did was look at which was better at selecting a trial lens, me as a practitioner with my experience or the CSP Pro and, and using that data, exporting it into the Blanchard calculator and using the recommended trial lens and putting that on the eye. And what we found when we did this was in the practitioner, uh, myself, who was doing this, uh, I found that it took me on uh, these, we did three patients, six eyes. Uh, on three of those eyes, it took me two lenses to find the correct trial lens that is gonna be adequate for, uh, you know, for a starting point. And for the fellow three eyes, uh, it required me one lens because I had the data there looking at the maps and saying, okay, yeah, based on a normal, you know, Pentacam four maps refractive, uh, you know, these two eyes are about the same depth. So, you know, same lens that worked on that eye, I'll probably look at work on this eye. And what we found was that with doing that, I found that uh, I had lens clearance between 200 and 500 microns. So in an area that I deemed to be acceptable, right? Well, with the CSP Pro, uh, the exporting the data and putting it into the Blanchard calculator, um, all six eyes only required one lens. And the clearance tolerance was incredibly tight. Uh, each one of these had about 200 to 300 microns of clearance just like we had anticipated. So this ended up being really, really good. And I would consider myself a, a skilled practitioner in this area, and it did way better than me. Um, you know, when it looked at me, it was 1.5 lenses, you know, plus or minus 0.5, whereas the CSP did it in one. So even with just six eyes, it was a statistically significant difference. Um, now, when we look at the data-driven lenses, what we found, and this was kind of very interesting, was we took 31 eyes that have previously failed scleral lens fits uh, in a diagnostic lens. And those individuals failed uh, after three to seven lens attempts uh, to try and get their diagnostically fit lens to fit their eyes. Um, well, what we then did was we took those individuals, uh, we deemed those failures, and what we did was we went ahead and got profilometry scans and we designed lenses for those eyes. Now this wasn't done specifically uh, with just wave or scan fit uh, and wasn't even just specific to uh, using the CSP Pro software, but the concept here was the use of uh, profilometry and it can it get success when a diagnostically fit lens fails and what we found was on these 31 eyes almost all of them could be fit uh, by doing the scan fit or the the scan based lenses for them and they were able to get a finalized fit on average in 2.2 lenses plus or minus one so imagine failing seven times uh, with a diagnostically fit lens, but getting it right in two lenses. Uh, that's a pretty uh, substantial difference there. Um, now, CSP specifically, we can export this data into multiple different design softwares, whether it's WAVE and we can derive, you know, freeform or GSIM or radially symmetric lenses, or we can even use ScanFit, uh, which is one of uh, iPrint softwares and that has recently been licensed for use uh, with Synergize. So you can build you know, a variety of different lenses. Uh, also, this can be uploaded into a variety of different lens calculators, such as the online lens calculator from Blanchard, and you can even use it for the uh, Boston Sight Smart Sight 360, or excuse me, not Smart Sight, I forget the name of it. It's uh, Smart Smart 360 is what it's called, um, but all of those can allow you to get geometrically, uh, or rather, profilometry driven, uh, CSP profilometry driven, data driven designs for your patients to overcome 
complex geometries of the eye. Um, and you can create these wonky wild shapes uh, that really follow the wonky wild ocular contour. So when we look at this, you know, one of the things that we like to look at is, you know, best lens selection, right? When we see a KC patient or a keratoconic patient, we go, well, should we go with a corneal or a scleral lens, right? Well, one of the best papers uh, or posters and one of the highly referenced posters at GSLS, uh, this is actually from 2014, uh, but it's still just as relevant today. Uh, this was Frank Zhang's work when he was at uh, Pacific uh, University with uh, you know, all the, uh, the recognizable characters over there, uh, all the, the usual suspects, if you will. Um, what they did was they looked at corneal elevation differences. And what they found was if you had a elevation of greater than 350 microns, um, you should be in a scleral lens. If you had less than 350 microns of elevation difference from the top to the bottom of the cornea, you had a 88.2% success rate with a corneal gas perm, right? So what we can see is if we put our best fit sphere into this eye, you can see a portion of it is above the best fit sphere and a portion of it is below the best fit sphere. Now, the cool part about this, and this is where we now kind of get off of the topic of the CSP, but talk about the other benefits for your contact lens fitting, is that this data can be exported into WAVE. And what you can see here is we did two different lenses on the same eye here, right? But it's the same source data, and it's good data. And what we did was we best fit a lens, corneal lens, to this cornea, and you can see the simulated fluorescing patterns off to the upper left of both of these images. And what you can see is on this eye, uh, in the left-hand image, uh, we decided to create a toric or a geometrically symmetrical uh, rigid gas permeable. And what you can see is over the superior area, so the superior is on the right-hand side of the image, the or, or the, of the corneal cross section and the left side is the inferior side and you can see in the inferior we're edge lifted away from the cornea and in the superior area you can see that we are over vaulted uh, just above the corneal apex that little gap there and you can see a representation of this in the tear film right the tear film map below. You can see that we have more uh, uh, tear film underneath that area just above the apex. And then if we go below that apex, you can see our tear film gets larger as the cornea is lifted away. Now what we can do, and this is where it gets really cool and where that paper uh, might actually need to be modified, because if you're using these data-driven designs, you may be able to create lenses that even with more than 300 microns of difference in the elevation, you can still create corneal gas perms that fit the eye very, very well. So you can see in this eye, what we did was on the right side here, we used the same source data, this is the same eye, but instead of using a toric or geometrically symmetric design, we went ahead and changed this into a freeform design. And with the freeform design, you can see how it follows the exact contour of that cornea. And you can see that we get a nice, even tear film or tear film distribution underneath that lens uh, in the simulation. And you can see with our fluorescein map, we no longer have a hot spot where we're you know, bearing down on the apex, nor do we have areas of edge lift or over vault. So this can be an ideal way to fit your complex patients. But the thing to be said here is if you can fit a complex patient with this, you can certainly do it on a normal patient and it works very well. Now I'm gonna go into a couple uh, cases here, but I have to say thank you to Dr. Becky Sue and Dr. Jenny Nguyen. Uh, these were my uh, interns. Uh, Dr. Sue is actually now my corneal fellow uh, at, uh, at the Corneal Laser Eye Institute, um, but they helped prepare these cases when I presented them uh, a bit back. Um, but basically what I'm going to do is show you other things that you can do uh, 
uh, that you may not have thought of when you think of using these devices. So this is a patient in our first case. This is a 55-year-old patient who is referred to us for a keratoconus workup. The history does sound like keratoconus. He's had poor vision. He's a long-term gas permeable lens wear. His vision is much, much worse on the right eye, and he has significant anisotropia. So he was referred to get scans to work him up to see, you know, hey, I think this guy has keratoconus. What do you think? So you can see his uncorrected visual acuity on his right eye is hand motion. His left eye is 2400. If we look at his manifest refraction, he's minus 15.5 on the right side uh, and only corrects to 2100. And on the left side, he's uh, minus 650, minus two and a half. So you can see there's some asymmetry in the amount of cylinder power uh, present, but you can see that massive difference in, uh, in sphere power, right? and he only corrects to 2100 in the right eye and 2050. So let's take it to the Wave AXL and let's see what happens here. So we go ahead and we map out his corneas and you can see on this, uh, this four maps refractive, if we take a look at the axial map on the upper right, you can see on that right hand, uh, on that right image, this is not keratoconus, right? This is a warped cornea from corneal gas permeable wear. If we look at the elevations maps of the front and the back of the corneas, you can see that there's no focal elevations that would indicate or suggest uh, keratoconus. You can see that his corneal thickness has normal corneal thickness distributions and is of a normal thickness overall. So it's really just the anterior surface that's a little wonky here, right? Then when we go to the other eye, what we can see on the left-hand side, again, no signs of frank elevation deviations on the front or the back. The distributions look pretty normal. Thicknesses look pretty normal. You can see a good amount of astigmatism here uh, with a little bit of warpage as well because he wore uh, those corneal gas perms. But I think we can safely rule out keratoconus at this point. We can look at his aberrations though, and what we can see is that he does have indeed elevated higher order aberrations on the right side compared to the left side. So we could say, oh, well, this may be something that you know we should look at, and that may correspond with the amount of, uh, of warpage to that right cornea in comparison to the left. Well, we also have our optical biometry, right? And lo and behold, what we find is that in his right eye, he has a axial length of 31.5 millimeters. On his left side, he has an axial length of 26.9. So clearly, he has a deviation here, which is explaining his massive anisometropia and his lifelong uh, amblyopia that's been there. So what was our diagnosis in this case? It's not keratoconus, it's corneal warpage, secondary to corneal gas permeable wear. He is anisotropic due to his axial length, and he has uh, refractive amblyopia in his right eye. Now, let's move on to case two. This one involves an individual who I fit with a scleral lens, and they're coming back in and saying, you know, my vision is okay, but it's really not that good. There's still a lot of streaking and blurriness in the vision. You know, can we make this vision any better? So when we look at her best corrected visual acuity with her scleral lenses worn, She's 20-25 in each eye and 20-25 plus with both eyes together. If I do an over refraction, you know, we can see a plus a quarter on the left eye. It's plus a quarter minus a quarter, but neither one of those is actually improving the vision any. This is the corneal topography that we're working with to give you an idea. You can see that they have this massive amount of uh, corneal astigmatism that's present you know, thinner than average corneas, posterior elevation defects, and anterior elevation, kind of all the classic signs of keratoconus here. Um, now, 
what I did was the aberrometry over this individual's eyes while wearing their scleral lens. And what you can see is that they have a good amount of aberrations present, 0.469 and 0.38, right? So when I look at this, you can also see that there's a good amount of coma present, right? And when I look at this, I go, well, you know, though there's nothing that I can do with a diagnostically, uh, or excuse me, with, a, you know, just simple sphere sill, because of the advances in higher order aberration correcting lenses, I know that I can get or create a higher order aberration correcting contact lens for you that will help to minimize that. And that's what we did. And what you can see is that we minimize the amount of higher order aberrations present. We were able to reduce the aberrations by 40% in the right eye and by 35% of the left eye. And you can see that we reduced the amount of coma in both eyes. And you can see that her vision improved to 2020 plus in each eye and 2020 minus with both eyes together. And if we take a look at the, uh, the point spread functions, which are a way of simulating uh, the, um, uh, simulating the quality of vision, you can see the point spread functions off to the left are with the original lens and the point spread functions off to the right are with the newer lens. And you can see how much tighter and closer to a perfect point we're getting uh, after using those higher order aberration correcting lenses. So this device really has ubiquitous usage. It's not just a one trick pony that you're going to get for, you know, just cornea or just for creating scleral lenses, but it gives you all of the possibilities in the world to create very custom uh, contact lenses for individuals to monitor ocular disease, whether it be, you know, for, you know, uh, progressive axial length elongation uh, in, uh, you know, myopia management. It's also good for evaluating the quality of the optical system. It's able to, you know, take a look at differences between, you know, progressing in keratoconus or stability in keratoconus and all sorts of various different use cases. So CSP is just one of the many, but it's a very important one. So with that, I'll thank you and I'll bring Bill back on for any questions that we might have. John, great information. Wow, really, really comprehensive and probably the best explanation of the use of CSP Pro that I've seen to date. So thank you so much. I want to back up before I ask some, because you answered a lot of the questions that the audience has already posted, and I'm mm -hmm. going to re-ask a few of them. But I have a question for you because my experience when I went from traditional trial lens scleral fitting to profilometry assisted lens fitting, it was fairly revolutionary and I didn't expect it to be as as uh, changing my practice patterns as it had become. Um, when you started doing profilometry, how, how did it impact your, uh, your, your way of fitting lenses or the way you approached the lenses? You talked a little bit about it and you I, I wanna highlight, because um, for me, going from putting a fourth or fifth trial lens on a patient's eye to only <laughs> one or two, number one, the, the patients have lost confidence in me by the time I'm putting a fourth lens on their eye, even though I know I know what I'm doing. But that was the only way to do it prior to this. And um, and I frankly was shocked at looking at people's scleras that I had fit with lenses that I settled on that were good enough and then refit them with these scler with the scleral profile uh, data and the improvement in the fit was almost embarrassing that I was satisfied with what they used to wear. Um, but I, I want you to share your experiences on how profilometry in general has changed how you do it and, and how and what you and how you handle patients. Oh, it, it's it's night and day. You know, profilometry is kind of, you know, you, you could almost think of back to the days of you know, trying to fit corneal gas perms without a topographer, right? If you looked at the eye and you put a lens on, you could kind of figure out what direction you need to go and you can understand the corneal shape, but it's, you know, it takes putting a lens on to figure that out, right? 
Same thing with scleral lens fitting, right? I got to put a lens on to figure that out. But what lens? How many lenses is it going to take? All those sorts of things. This is giving you an idea of what the contour is of the eye. So before I even see the patient, I understand, you know, hey, a diagnostic lens is just not going to work here. So I got to fit them with a profilometry driven lens. Or, hey, you know, this even looks complex for a profilometry driven lens. I got to go ahead and do an impression. You know, there's right. all of these sorts of things that it, it just helps guide everything in your decision making, which makes it so much simpler uh, in the way that you do it. Now, we've also looked at a couple different things as far as, you know, benchmarking how many lenses it took to, to fit a successful eye. And when we look at diagnostically fit lenses, my diagnostic average was around 2.5 plus or minus 1.2 lenses. But if I looked at my profilometry driven lenses, it was 2.2 plus or minus 0.1. Now that doesn't seem like a big difference until you realize that about half of those profilometry eyes had failed diagnostic lens fitting beforehand. And when I fail, I really fail, right? I really put a lot of effort into getting that. How, how long do you think that patient's in your office back then compared to how long they're in your office now for the complete fitting? Oh, much, much shorter periods of time. You know, this was something where you'd rack your brain, tear your hair out and go, gosh, I'm on lens six. And I just, oh my God, it's the fit that's never going to end. This looks terrible. I can't possibly leave a patient like this. Or... You know, I could leave the patient like this, but they're never going to wear the lens, right? Right. Um, you know, this really has become a nice troubleshooter for that, where you understand what's going on, where's the problem, why isn't this lens design working, and more importantly, well, I have the option to create a data-driven design to solve all those problems. Can you comment a little bit about um, and it's been my experience that this has been a game changer also, the reduction on um, bubbles and insertion and uh, midday fogging with lenses de designed with profilometry. Absolutely. You know, you're, and I, I actually, I'm dealing with a case right now uh, where I had fit them diagnostically and I swear up and down on mm -hmm. all the quadrants uh, where I can actually control the lens shape, it is aligned. But there are these tiny little areas where the conjunctiva is focally depressed and it's just a panel right into the back of the lens that just pumps debris under the lens and fogs up this guy's vision in like an hour or two. And, you know, he's highly allergic to everything. So he makes a lot of mucus and it's just a disaster, right? Well, what I found is if I used a profilometry driven lens that takes into account that little area, that little, uh, you know, depression that was allowing a channel of fluid to, to go in under the lens, the lens now seals to the eye, which then allows us to trap out that debris so that he maintains fog-free vision throughout the day. So because of the, you know, high level of detail that these scans can provide, um, you can create a lens that really, really follows the contour and really overall, you know, you won't have, you know, bubbles that come in because, you know, you get those like fine champagne bubbles that'll happen yeah. if you have like a loose superior edge and over time, those little champagne bubbles will coalesce into one big <laughs> yeah. uh, you don't get that with profilometry driven lenses because you're uh, you know you're uh, following the contour of the eye much better now that's not to say that profilometry driven lenses are absolutely perfect every single time and they require no you know uh, modification to them obviously they do you know we have to modify you know all lenses but you know, this is modification uh, that is, you know, following the geometry of the eye 
rather than you know guessing at it and saying well it kind of looks like i want to tuck this area a little bit more you know you can be much much more precise with your changes and produce lenses that just it wouldn't be possible otherwise let's get some audience questions here there's some really good ones here um i know it's always thrilling for my technicians and even myself when we can capture an eye with one scan, um, but some patients can be difficult. Some anatomy is difficult. Can you give us some tips on scanning uh, CSP scans on those difficult patients, whether it's inset eyes or uh, the small orbits or just difficult patients cooperation wise? Can you share any tips that you do? Yeah. And, and I'll add on to that. And do you use a lid speculum? Yeah. So, so, <laughs> so I'll, I'll give you the whole thing here. So our big, you know, uh, uh, understanding actually came from capturing images uh, with a, a small cone uh, topographer, right? And what we found was, you know, to get into the orbit, to get close enough to the, a lot of eyes, we had to turn the head to get, a, you know, a certain arrangement, right? So if you can imagine your nose and your geometry of your eye, right? Your, uh, your nose to your temporal side essentially makes a right angle. So I'm gonna turn on my camera so I can kind of demonstrate what I'm talking about, right? So if we take a look at me, hi everybody, it's John Gelly. Uh, so when we're, when we're looking at this, essentially if I'm looking straight ahead at this camera, right? I have a straight on angle here, and I have another angle over here, right? And those angles make up my eye. And if I try to take a scan straight on this way, we're not going to get my whole uh, eye being, uh, you know, scanned because you're going to get some of the temp or the nasal area is going to be missing there because it's covered by my eye. But if I simply rotate my head a little bit and look at the camera now, you can see now you're getting equal spacing on either side, right? So it's all about turn the head so you open up that angle to the device so that you're getting the maximum area there. And then the other thing is the tilt of the head. If you look at me, I have this nice Cro-Magnum brow here, right? <laughs> so if we look at my brow uh, from the side, you can see how it sticks out quite a bit, right? When we look at that, what helps is, again, to think of the angles that are created, right? If we say that this is a shelf sticking out straight ahead, and you know I have kind of a slope over here because I don't have intense cheekbones, right? What do we do? Well, we tilt the head back a little bit, and that opens up that angle again, right? So what I recommend is to get that tilt have your patient jut their chin forward up over that little uh, lump or uh, lip on the, uh, on the chin. Cup. Yeah. Exactly, the little cup there. And what you're going to do is help them tilt their chin a little bit, turn their head a little bit, and look right into the target, and you're going to get the most wide open uh, white that you can get. Then what I do, I... I don't actually like to use tools for this. I literally will get in there, slide two fingers uh, at the sides of the lids, and then come over the top. And that's much harder to do when you're looking at a camera and trying to do it on yourself. But I'll do, you know, two lids or two fingers over here, I'll hold the upper and the lower, and kind of pull that way, and then go ahead and and take my images. Now, one thing that's very very important is you know, just like when you're fitting scleral lenses and you're trying to get lid control, uh, if things are wet or slippery, you're never going to grab the lens. So sometimes what we'll do is we'll have patients use a little lid wipe uh, beforehand so that I can get their, uh, their lids so that they're oil free. So I get a good grip on the lids when I'm holding them apart. Um, in other patients, you know, I have used a spring loaded or you know like kind of a, a a tension speculum rather than one that you you know screw crank open yeah exactly if you use that tension speculum 
you can actually hold it off to the side and put a little bit of tension in it or release it a little bit and you know kind of move those lids around but personally i'm a big fan of just get your fingers in there and hold it open the lid stick can work well what i found though is that if i'm not doing the lid stick uh what will happen is you know whoever's taking the scan has more of a tendency to instead of wanting to pull straight down or roll downward or upward they kind of push inward and push onto the globe so that's why i like the fingers is you can get them out of the way and it's just pulling rather than you know pushing in uh onto things so that's that's my preference on it but that that's my kind of tricks and tips and and don't do this as a you know uh I, I like to have you know a couple hands involved when i do it simply so that i can get the one shots like i am all about getting the one shot right mm -hmm. like it is, it is very gratifying oh yeah like like i will tell you i will i will take multiple scans if i don't get the one shot <laughs> like like i will try to get the one shot multiple times like obviously i'll get the three shot but then i'll go back and go well okay great but let me try to get the one shot you know so can you comment on the use of topical anesthetic use it on everybody yes. love it yeah i mean i, I will it, yeah. tell you that patients are so much more cooperative and just like less tense if they can't really feel you around their eye mm -hmm. like it is it is night and day like uh now the important thing on this anesthetic not anesthetic plus fluorescein uh, <laughs> exactly know. yeah and i and i have found that put the anesthetic in both eyes and when you're done with the yeah. first eye put another drop in the second eye because by then it probably is worn off partially or fully by then also yeah i mean i, I find it to be super easy and the nice thing is is like we have we have a Corvus in our office and it's right there. Immediately afterwards, we move right down to the Corvus. They can't even feel it. It's great. It's, it's interesting. In my practice, I've got three technicians and um, one of them can do these CSP scans without any help or assistance in 99% of the cases. That the other bad. two, the other two almost always need either each other or me to be the lid yeah. person to, to help them with the lid. So it really, uh, we had a question from the audience about do you need two people? And I, they, it really depends on the skill of your technicians and how long they've been doing it and, and just how comfortable they are. Some technicians really don't like touching patients' eyelids and others really feel very comfortable doing it and do a very good job at without putting pressure on the globe, like you indicated, it could be a problem. Yeah, yeah. And I would agree with that. You know, it really comes down to you know how comfortable are they and what's their skill level you know some technicians i mean i will tell you it, even you know obviously we take interns from you know various different programs uh when we have our interns there some of them you know just right away bam they got right. it all done you know so it's uh it really just comes down to the, the level of comfort of just getting in there and getting that lid open a question about um, the one of the cases that you presented, the high order aberrating correcting lens. And the question from the audience is, how did you create that HOA correcting lens? Was the data from the Pentacam exported to the lab directly or and what lab did you use? Ah, so this actually was done uh, with a, a different device. <laughs> so the, the creation of that lens. Now you can export the uh, CSP data uh, for use with um, uh, a couple of different labs, but I have found uh, that the best system for this is actually uh, currently the um, uh, the Ovitz uh, system, mm -hmm. uh, which is what I use to create that lens. Uh, what I did though was I compared that data, and that's how I kind of decided that we were going to go down that route was by looking at the aberrations derived from the CSP. Um, so I just said, hey, you know, I get these aberration measurements on every patient anyway. What do they look like on this patient? Oh, they're elevated. Let's see if we can knock those down by using a higher order aberration correcting lens. 
and that's uh, that's what we did. And that was a huge success. I'm sure that patient was thrilled and probably never saw that clearly ever in their life before. So that's amazing. I'm happy. <laughs> yeah. So John, we're at the top of the hour. I want to thank you so much for hanging in and answering the questions and presenting this material. It was fantastic. And uh, I wish everyone a great night. This uh, is recorded and the recording will be available in approximately a week. Uh, I want to thank everyone again for submitting questions and everyone have a great night. Thanks again, John. Thank you.